Welcome, Adam's children, to this week's message that Adam commanded I bring to you. Fallout's universe closely parallels our own, and this is a source of endless speculation. What would your town, your state, your country look like in the Fallout universe? Some things we don't have to wonder as much about because the game gives us a good amount of information, and one of those things is one of the responsible parties for bathing the world in Adam's holy glow. We know more about the US military than any other military in the Fallout universe, with China being a relatively distant second. But how much would we actually recognize from the US military in Fallout? What commonalities would there be? How big are the differences? Well, I bring to you four intriguing differences. Examine them in detail and investigate why these differences may exist in the first place. So. Crank up the rads, and let's get started by looking at the first major deviation. The first item I want to discuss is near and dear to my heart, because I love aircraft, and I have since I was a wee irradiated lad. In Fallout, we do not see very many military aircraft, and there could be a potential reason for that. The United States was, after all, in an enormous war with the only other major power who were in a fight for some of the last usable energy resources on the planet. That said, it wouldn't be unrealistic to see military aircraft once in a while, either at an airbase like Nellis in New Vegas or Adams Air Force Base in Fallout 3 that were being fixed, tested, or used as training aircraft. If not at an airbase, why not crashed in the wasteland from the nuclear EMP blasts and shockwaves like we see with a number of civilian aircraft? We only see three military aircraft through the entirety of the series, unless we count the Hellion in Fallout Tactics, which I will only talk about a little bit. The fighter jet that is mostly seen at Rivet City in Fallout 3 is an exact copy of the real-life P-80, although the ones we see in-game are a naval version with folded wings. The P-80 was one of the first jet aircraft produced by the United States, having been introduced in 1945 and was officially retired from service in 1959 and definitely looks like a product of its time. The design is very conventional, with straight wings, and just looks like it's straight from the 1940s. No shade though, it is a handsome devil. It is actually debated whether or not the P-80 found in Fallout was an active wartime aircraft because of just how old the design is. They are scattered about Rivet City, which would seem to indicate that they were being used in some wartime capacity, and there is a crashed one in the Point Lookout DLC, proving that, yes, these were being flown in the year of our Atom 2077. A transport plane that can be seen at Camp McCarran in Fallout New Vegas is very similar to the C-47 Skytrain, which is yet another World War II era aircraft that was used extensively until it was retired from the US military service in 1975, although it would go on to serve longer in other air forces around the world. Next we see the Stingray Deluxe, a completely original aircraft that featured in Fallout 4 and appeared again in Fallout 76. There is a lot to say about this interesting design, and I have a video where I went over all the aircraft that are found in the series, so I won't retread that ground. The last of all the aircraft was a cutting-edge concept at the time, and it is the iconic Vertibird. This tilt-wing aircraft aided the US war effort against China in a limited capacity, and would go on to be used by both the Enclave and the Brotherhood of Steel well after the war. The versatility and vertical takeoff and landing abilities make them the ideal vehicle in a world where roads are decayed and destroyed and airfields are in equal disrepair. From these four aircraft, we get a glimpse into what the state of aerospace technology looked and functioned like in Fallout. And from that, we start to see stark differences between the game series and real life modern designs built to suit modern combat needs and philosophy. One of the first and most obvious differences is that in Fallout, Speed must not be an important or desirable attribute. 
The older designs, the C-47 and P-80, were both designed at a time and within design and technological limitations that meant they could only ever fly at subsonic speeds. Even if we were to grant that the fighter jet, for example, was given a more powerful and modern engine, maybe even some crazy nuclear engine because, you know, fallout, aspects of the design would make it very hard or downright suicidal to break the sound barrier. The straight wing configuration that is used on the P-80 makes it experience shock waves and increased aerodynamic drag as it approaches and exceeds the speed of sound. That issue could be overcome by brute force like the straight wing design on the X-1 Bell aircraft that was the first plane to break the sound barrier in level flight. But the real issue is the P-80 uses a horizontal stabilizer that is fixed at the rear of the aircraft with adjustable parts known as elevators on the trailing edge. Put simply, speeds near and past the speed of sound cause air separation or turbulence, which makes control surfaces like the elevators much less responsive. If the fighter jet seen in Fallout 3 was meant to be used at supersonic speeds, it would not use the conventional horizontal stabilizer that we see it with, but instead a stabilator, which is designed specifically to overcome these separation issues. The Stingray Deluxe has an altogether different design, but also has some characteristics that show that it is not meant for high-speed flight. The large protruding rivets would cause some issues with aerodynamics, and the issue here isn't necessarily the presence of rivets. Modern aircraft use rivets as well. It has to do with the size and how far they protrude from the skin of the aircraft. Secondly, the plane uses a blended and braced wing design, seen by what looks like a second wing that attaches at the intakes. This design is better for generating lift and could increase the aircraft's efficiency, but would produce undue drag at supersonic speeds. Another aspect of many modern combat aircraft is a trend towards using stealth capabilities to make detection much more difficult. Using specially designed profiles with low radar cross sections, special materials and paints for radar absorption, and active electronic jamming systems. We can't speak to the electronic jamming systems that could be present on the aircraft since those would be inside the planes, but neither fighter shows a specialized stealthy cross-section or radar-absorbing paints and materials. We will actually get into this more a little later, but that is another important distinction between the aircraft of Fallout and many of our world. Unfortunately, we don't get to see any bombers. There is a Chinese bomber plane shown in the Operation Anchorage DLC, but we're not talking about the Chinese military in this video and we aren't really sure how true to events the Operation Anchorage DLC even is. In Fallout Tactics, there was a pre-war prototype aircraft of an original design that was meant to function as a ground attack aircraft, being armed with air-to-surface missiles, bombs, and dual cannons, but rather interestingly, was meant to fly at speeds only around 400 miles per hour. So again, not a fast aircraft. It would be great to see some real bombers in future games, but their absence may be explained by the fact that there was an active war going on. It would be very interesting to see what bombers could look like in Fallout, since bombers play a very important role in modern nuclear military doctrine. The nuclear triad is the name given to the strategy of relying on three separate methods of deploying nuclear weapons. These three methods are using bomber aircraft, using intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs, and using submarine-based ballistic missiles. The idea behind the separation and use of various forms of deployment is that it would be impossible for an enemy to completely prevent nuclear retaliation. Let's say a preemptive strike somehow destroys all airfields that support nuclear-capable bombers. Well, there are ICBMs and submarines that could still strike. Actually seeing bombers in the Fallout games could indicate that the Fallout world also had a nuclear triad as a way to deter nuclear engagements, although that would partly depend on the kind of bombers that we would see. Now the Vertibird is quite reminiscent in function to the V-22 Osprey, which is a modern tilt-rotor aircraft that was first deployed in 2007 and is still in active use. It was designed due to a need seen in the 1980s for a new type of aircraft that could take off and land vertically and also carry combat troops at speed. The project looked to overcome the speed limitations of helicopters that do not afflict conventional aircraft. It appears that the military in Fallout saw a similar need, 
although at a much later date, since it was new and not fully deployed by the time of the Great War in 2077. So to summarize the state of military aircraft in Fallout that we see in game, fighter designs range from very dated designs based on the P-80 to completely original designs like the Stingray. However, neither of these designs are made for supersonic flight, which is a requirement for all modern fighters and multi-role aircraft. They are also not designed for stealth, which is a very desirable trait for the new generation planes. We cannot say anything about the bombers, because we don't see any, but the Fallout universe saw a need for a tilt-wing aircraft similar to our modern day, just much later. Tanks and armored vehicles are another essential part of any modern military, and we get a glimpse at tanks in Fallout as well. We see tanks in three games, one in Fallout Tactics, and another type that is found in both Fallout 4 and Fallout 76. I will focus on the tank seen in the later games, but touch on the Fallout Tactics tank as well. The tank that is seen in Fallout 4 and 76 is a completely original design, and not only is it a unique design, but it drastically diverges from modern tank designs in almost every way. Actually, it diverges from tank designs of almost any known period. I will save the details for when I remaster my vehicles of Fallout series, but there are attributes of this tank that seem to show that it would most likely be classified as a heavy tank. This distinction is important because modern tanks are classified as main battle tanks rather than heavy tanks. In the early 20th century, when militaries started to see the potential of tanks, several classifications arose based on the attributes of the tank and its intended purpose. Heavy tanks emphasized two primary attributes, armor and firepower. Due to this, they sacrificed mobility and historically were intended to use their superior firepower to shell fortified positions and bully light and medium tanks. I think the Fallout tank falls into the heavy tank category for two main reasons. The first is the double cannon configuration, which is only something you do if you are really trying to maximize firepower or if you're an insane Soviet engineer in an alternate timeline. It will soon be a wasteland. While on paper this would improve the potential firepower, in reality it ends up being heavy, complicated, and not worth the extra engineering or weight required for the design. The second attribute that I think helps classify this as a heavy tank design is the quad track design. There are pros and cons to having a split track design that is seen on this tank, especially if there are two independent motors. But what advantages it might have over a unified track design in getting over certain types of terrain or towing heavy loads, it loses in speed. Without knowing certain details about the armor, we can only speculate as to its thickness, but it seems pretty clear that the tank in Fallout would be classified as a heavy tank due to its focus on firepower and likely lower speeds because of the quad track configuration, which would likely necessitate heavy armor. Heavy tanks saw their heyday in the latter part of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War. The last of the heavy tanks produced by the United States was the M103, which was introduced in 1957 and discontinued in 1974 because of the evolution in tank doctrine. Main battle tanks would come to replace both medium and heavy tanks because the classification grew out of the medium tank designation, which had a good mix of armor, firepower, and mobility. Technology improved to the point in the 1970s that heavily armored and heavily armed tanks need not be as slow as they once were, and anti-tank weapons also developed to the point that they were able to defeat the thickest armor that could be fielded, like the newly developed anti-tank guided missiles and high explosive anti-tank rounds. Priorities shifted from heavy armor to defeat all threats and towards mobility as a way to avoid threats and be more reactive to an evolving battlefield. So it appears that in the Fallout world at least, that the change from dedicated, medium, and heavy tanks into a combined main battle tank never really happened, because the tank we are presented with would be slower and focused on sheer firepower with its dual cannons. That isn't quite the end of it, however, because tank armor has either not evolved to the extent of our modern day, or it took a completely different path. The first most noticeable aspect in regards to the armor design is that it doesn't follow the angled or rounded armor designs 
that were developed during World War II and the Cold War, which helped in increasing the tank's effective armor, increasing the chances of surviving a direct hit. The fallout design has a number of flat surfaces on the turret as well as the hull. The front of the hull is particularly puzzling because that area usually gets the thickest armor and is usually carefully designed with angled plates to increase survivability. The final interesting point about the tank's armor is that it is very clearly using riveted armor. Riveted armor was one of the earliest forms of tank armor as it was initially the best way to affix sheets of metal to a tank frame. After World War I, nations would experiment with welded armor and fully cast armor. That is to say that they would use a mold to create entire steel armor sections of a tank. All of these different approaches had their benefits and negatives, but the riveted armor approach fell out of favor and widespread use by the end of World War II. One of the big drawbacks to using riveted armor was potentially making the interior of the tank more dangerous for the crew. Rivets have two heads, one on either side of the metal, that they are holding together. When a shell impacted the tank's armor, there was a decent chance of the interior rivet heads breaking loose at high velocities, killing crew and damaging the interior. The presence of rivets tells us two things about tank armor in the Fallout universe. One, it may not have advanced to the level of modern day tank armors, which uses advanced techniques and layers of different materials like ceramics, depleted uranium, or advanced polymers in addition to steel. The second option is that the Fallout universe invented entirely different materials to boost the protective abilities of tank armor, and for some reason, riveting was just the best way to implement this armor. We know there are some exotic materials in the Fallout world like Saturnite, so it is certainly possible that material science went in such a different direction that some things like tank armor resulted in a vastly different state than the real world. The only other tank that we see in the series is in Fallout Tactics, and this is a World War II era Sherman tank. I think it's funny to just point out that with aircraft, the later Fallouts had the World War II era plane shown by the P-80, and Tactics had an advanced and completely unique looking aircraft. And now with tanks, it's Fallout Tactics with the World War II technology and the later Fallouts with a completely original design. So to sum up the differences in tank development and use in Fallout versus the real world, Fallout did not converge on the concept of a main battle tank, instead opting for what we would classify as a heavy tank platform, and they also did not go through the same armor evolution. Neither the form of the armor, like angled plating, nor the implementation, like them opting for riveting, happened like it did in our world. Fallout either had a lot of stagnation when it came to the evolution of tank doctrine, design, or technology, or it developed in such a different way that it just has the appearance of being outdated designs and technology. A key technology that has had such a massive effect on the Fallout World's United States military that it literally turned the tide of the Sino-American War is none other than Power Armor. Power Armor is an inseparable element of the Fallout games, and for some of us was the first thing we saw on the box art when buying the game. The concept of using a powered exoskeleton to enhance soldiers' ability to wage war isn't unique to Fallout, and such attempts have been made in the modern military era. Although the overall objective is the same, to make soldiers more effective at soldiering, Fallout goes about things a bit differently. In Fallout, the most fundamentally important aspect of power armor is its defensive capabilities. No other armor comes close to protecting as well as power armor does, and it was this ability for power armored soldiers to survive in extremely dangerous scenarios where no one else could that started to make the difference in the war against China. The second most important feature was the enhanced strength through the advanced motors and servos that allowed U.S. soldiers to wield far larger weapons, increasing their firepower potential several times over a standard infantryman. In addition, power armor increases the endurance of soldiers and allowed them to stay engaged for longer with the help of support systems that recycled waste, air filtration systems to protect against chemical, biological, and radiological threats, radiation shielding, 
and a heads-up display to present the user with relevant data. We don't know all the power armor technologies that were used on the battlefield, but they had gone as far as developing integrated jetpacks, shock-absorbing technology that lets people survive extremely high falls, chem pumps that will automatically inject chems when the wearer gets injured, and Tesla coils that can either boost energy weapon damage output or do damage to nearby enemies themselves. And that's only to name a few. Power Armor is also very bulky, taking up a lot more space than any other conventional type of armor and even requiring a dedicated frame that the user steps up and into as the entirety of the unit closes around them. Soldiers wearing power armor were unable to do many mundane tasks outside of combat, although one could conceivably use power armor to pull or carry heavy loads over rough terrain. Additionally, the last important aspect is that the suits are able to use incredibly energy-dense fusion cores, or fusion generators, that allow the suits to work for long periods at a time, as well as power energy-demanding technology like jetpacks. As strong as the power armor is, it did not replace tanks, as we see tanks in Fallout 4, and we know the tanks were being used and trained in as they are encountered at some military installations in Fallout 4 and 76. There is even one instance where a bunch of soldiers were goofing off and got one stuck, just in time for the bombs to fall. Power armor was, however, an evolution in ground combat that met the need of the United States military that was fighting a numerically superior and entrenched force in Alaska, and it was very effective at what it did. If we take a look at modern efforts to develop combat exoskeletons, we see some overlap, but some pretty major differences as well. In 2013, the Tactical Assault Light Operator Suit Project, or TALOS, was announced and was looking for very specific requirements. The ideal TALOS system would increase soldier endurance by bearing some of the weight of combat gear, contain a sensor array that would give the user relevant information about their own system, as well as integrated components that would allow for joint tactical coordination. All of this was meant to be in a package that could protect from small arms fire, and very interestingly, it had to be low profile enough to fit under existing combat uniforms. The Talos system was very ambitious, and even up to the late date of 2023, it has been acknowledged that technology is just not advanced enough to fully deliver on the project. Instead, different parts of the suit have had their own dedicated development projects scattered amongst researchers and other companies. One such system is the Revision Military Prower System, or the Kinetic Operations Suit, that both offer electronically assisted lower body support to help bear some of the weight of the user and increase one's endurance for long distance travel. This is a far cry from not only the original vision of the Talos system, but what we see in the Fallout universe as well. Modern projects to create a combat exoskeleton are hamstrung by power delivery. The battery technology is just not up to the task of powering an exoskeleton for a meaningful amount of time, which is just not a problem in the Fallout universe. The focus of modern exoskeleton projects also seem to mainly focus on increasing the strength and durability of the user, as well as integrating sensors and interconnectivity to increase combat effectiveness through smart data use. Power Armor in Fallout 4 it does take advantage of data, providing a useful HUD and even recognizing and highlighting potential targets. However, the focus of Power Armor is on its defensive abilities and enabling the user to use larger, more powerful weapons that they otherwise could not. Perhaps one of the biggest differences, however, is the goal of having a low-profile suit in the real world, not adding excess bulk or weight in order to allow soldiers to operate more or less how they currently do, rather than needing to develop purpose-built troop carriers to accommodate bulky power armor. Fallout has no qualms with this. In fact, certain parts of the armor seems much larger than necessary, particularly the pauldrons, which, yeah, while they look cool, just add incredible bulk and a bunch of weight for really only minor benefits. Perhaps the best way to summarize the differences is that in Fallout, 
power armor fills a space between infantry and armored vehicles. Whereas in the real world, well, exoskeletons don't do anything right now because they're only partial prototypes, but if the Talos project were exactly what it wanted to be, it would be more geared towards increasing soldiers' endurance and tactical awareness in a package that is as unobtrusive as possible. The last major difference between our modern US military and the version that existed in Fallout prior to the obliteration of damn near everything is the importance of and focus on stealth technology. In Fallout, stealth technology does exist, albeit in a very specific scope. The US military in Fallout was far less focused on stealth tech and instead put all their chips on nuclear power and power armor. This brute force doctrine stands in contrast to the Chinese military in Fallout who had developed rather extensive and impressive stealth tech that was more advanced than anything the United States had. The Chinese developed stealth suits that allowed Crimson Dragoon operators to become near invisible as they generated a so-called modulating field that bent light around the suit, making very effective active camouflage. There is even rumor and some circumstantial evidence that China has applied their advanced stealth technology to a fleet of submarines that is referred to as the Ghost Fleet. Now the focus here is on the US military, not China or anyone else, but I mention it only because it far outpaced the US's own stealth technology. In fact, the United States fell into possession of some Chinese stealth suits and set about reverse engineering the technology because they had nothing even close to it. They were able to develop devices that were named Stealth Boys, and although US engineers didn't really know how they worked, they replicated the active camouflage effect from the stealth suits. Stealth Boys work dynamically. They can hide an individual regardless of size, shape, or what they are wearing, which is a step above the stealth suits. However, the Stealth Boys come with a nasty side effect of inducing neurochemical changes in users' brains, which can cause paranoia, hallucinations, and even schizophrenia. There are a few versions of Stealth Boys, and these devices seem to represent the extent of the US's stealth capabilities. There are some applications of Stealth Boy technology, like the possibility of integrating Stealth Boy tech with power armor, as seen in Fallout 4 and 76 but the effect is short-lived when compared to the Chinese stealth suits. The US military in the Fallout universe doesn't seem as interested or motivated in stealth technologies until they see how effective the Chinese stealth tech is, then they rush to copy it with some success. This stands in contrast to very early interest in stealth technology in the real world. Stealth is a broad category but has seen the most success in aircraft and submarines. While active camouflage in the visible spectrum range is still not within our technological capability to deploy and use effectively in a combat environment, making aircraft invisible to radar or submarines invisible to sonar are effectively the same thing. The earliest stealth attempts were in the 1950s as the United States experimented with different materials and paints that could absorb or scatter incoming radar to help hide their U-2 spy planes from the Soviet Union. Stealth technology would continue to improve with projects like the SR-71 that used a profile to reduce its radar cross-section, and eventually aircraft whose primary attribute was to be as invisible as possible, like the F-117 and the B-2 stealth bomber. Stealth has continued to be desirable, and the US's latest air superiority fighter, the F-22, and its newest multi-role aircraft like the F-35 have been designed with the most cutting-edge stealth technology to date. Likewise, submarines have been engineered with soundproof materials and specially engineered screws that operate as silently as possible to avoid detection via sonar. More recently, there has been interest in using technology to hide the infrared signature of ground-based vehicles, since their hot engines can often be found with infrared imaging. Although the technology has yet to be thoroughly vetted in combat, special panels or surfaces can alter the surface infrared frequency to make the vehicle blend in with the background, or make the vehicle look like something else inconsequential or less threatening like a small car. 
Stealth technology in the modern US military is imperative to the functioning of submarines. And this seems to be consistent with the submarines that we encounter in the Fallout series as well. Stealthy aircraft have become increasingly important and in demand, but no such aircraft are seen or spoken of in the Fallout series. This is a major deviation, unless Bethesda has something up their sleeve to show us in future games. The Fallout series, however, has focused specifically on active camouflage for individual people, something that the military is interested in, but at this point we can only come close to replicating such technology in carefully controlled situations. A suit or a device that can bend light perfectly to make the object translucent as they move and fight from every single angle is something that just far outpaces current capabilities. It's also interesting to note that rather than the US being a pioneer in the stealth space, especially for aircraft, they are far behind the Chinese technology and desperately playing catch up in the years just before the Great War. Surprise! You get a small surprise entry here that I wanted to include because it is, or was, or may even still be, a major difference between the real world US military and fallouts. If that sentence was confusing, that's okay, it was kind of meant to be. A world without nuclear weapons sounds pretty nice, but if the Fallout world had no nuclear weapons, we would have no Fallout and I'd be pretty bummed out. The Vault Dweller Survival Guide was the manual or handbook for the first Fallout game and it had an entire section devoted to nuclear blast effects. Seriously, there are like 20 paragraphs that go into detail about all aspects of nuclear blasts but there is a very important revelation in this section. The survival guide states that megaton class weapons, which are the largest of the nuclear weapons that we produce, have been retired for smaller yield warheads. The guide even states that countries, the US included, seem to have decided to opt for smaller 200 to 750 kiloton warheads, rather than the enormous thermonuclear weapons that were first successfully tested in the 1950s and later successfully miniaturized for deployment in the 1960s. According to the Vault Dweller Survival Guide, these smaller yield bombs that nations started to opt for would result in greater amounts of radioactive fallout being deposited in the lower atmosphere and around the detonation area, increasing the risk of radiation exposure to those not caught up in the blast itself. Now this is certainly interesting and would seem appropriate for a game called Fallout, however in-game evidence contradicts the notion that only low yield nuclear weapons were used by the Great War belligerents. In the Fallout and Fallout 2 overworld maps, each map has at least one large prominent crater that can be seen. In the case of Fallout, it is near the Boneyard, and in Fallout 2 there are two just south of Redding. These craters are absolutely massive. I have a previous video where I used the map scale to estimate the size of these craters and they are many times bigger than the crater for the largest nuclear device ever detonated, the Tsar Bomba. This would seem to indicate that there were at least some nuclear devices that were much, much bigger than the survival guide suggests and the size of the craters would imply that the bombs that made these craters are even bigger than anything we have in our modern day. Fallout 4 also gives us a front row seat to a large nuclear detonation at the beginning of the game, the one nuclear detonation that was closest to hitting Boston proper. Based on the size of the crater and destroyed area, this would be more in line with a megaton yield bomb and not the smaller one spoken of in the survival guide. So we're at an impasse. If the survival guide is right, then the preference for smaller, dirtier bombs over larger ones would definitely also be a significant difference between Fallout's military and the real world. But then we're presented with evidence that the survival guide may be incorrect. So maybe it isn't different? I don't know if we'll ever find out, but I do have a personal preference for the smaller yield, dirtier bombs being used in Fallout. It makes sense to me that the smaller bombs would be used so that there would be more of the old world left to explore in game, and it only seems appropriate for there to be heaps of radiation and nuclear fallout for a game series that literally gets its name from that. I would love to hear what you think about any of this, but especially the last point. 
this was not meant to be an exhaustive treatise of every single way that the militaries and military doctrines are different, rather to look at some of the most obvious and most interesting examples. We could spend a long time looking at the standard issue rifles, the types of ammo chosen, the way the Fallout games use the National Guard and reserves. There's almost no end to the ways that we could compare the two, but this will suffice for now. Adam's blessings be upon you for making it to the end, and upon my patrons, whose selfless contributions have earned them indulgences from Adam. If you too would like a get out of jail free card, you can become a patron. Link in the description, or come to my Discord and let's have a chat. Take care of yourselves, brothers and sisters, and I will see you again very soon.